Hello, and welcome to the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky's Health for a Change training series. I'm Ashley Brower, Communications Director. We thank you for being here today during what we know is a really busy season for everybody. Um, we're taking a closer look at early knowledge, lifelong impact, how comprehensive health education improves long-term outcomes. And before we dive in, I do wanna tell you a little bit about our foundation. We are focused on healthcare access, tobacco use reduction, obesity and diabetes mitigation and prevention, as well as child, uh, children's health and specifically preventing and mitigating adverse childhood experiences. Much of what we do is in the policy realm, whether on the state level, local level, or even in the school or organizational level. We've got a lot to talk about today. And before we get started, I do want to let you know that after this webinar, we will send you an email with some additional resources. So keep a lookout for that. Our moderator today is Representative Lisa Wilner of Jefferson County. Dr. Wilner serves on the following interim committees, Education, Health, Welfare, and Community Services, Budget Review Subcommittee on Human Resources, and the, Medical, the Medicaid Oversight Advisory Committee. Um, Dr. Wilner? Uh, I will throw it over to you. Thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you to the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky for hosting this really important conversation today. Uh, we've got a great group of panelists and I'm gonna ask them each to introduce themselves. But um, before we get started, I just wanna uh, talk to you very briefly about Bill Request 119. Uh, this is a bill that is pre-filed for the 2022 legislative session. Uh, I have filed this bill every year since I have served in the legislature, so since 2019. And this is a bill that would require the teaching <clears throat> of comprehensive, age-appropriate, medically accurate, fully inclusive, comprehensive health education, including sex education. Um, the bill has not had a hearing yet. <clears throat> We're hoping to change that. Um, it's gotten a fair amount of um, notice in the media, but not really in a, a, a good way or a helpful way. Um, and we really, I'm hoping that we can make the point today about the health outcomes, the positive uh, academic outcomes, the positive safety outcomes that can happen for our young people well into adulthood when they have access to this type of educational experience in their K-12 uh, educational system. Um, so with that, that's what we're talking about today. I'm going to uh, ask each of the panelists to, to introduce herself, uh, to talk about her role in this work, uh, and also to just share a, a brief anecdote about why this work is important to them. Um, and let's, let's start off with Layla. Great, thank you Representative Wilner and also thank you to the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky for hosting this Health for a Change learning series. So my name is Layla Kaushan, she, her pronouns and I am the staff attorney at KSAP. So sexual assault and abuse, as we know, is a public health crisis that impacts all of us from an individual level to our society as a whole, within the workforce, within healthcare and everywhere else you can imagine. One of KSAP's priorities is to center policies that have a connection to stopping sexual assault and abuse before it occurs. And comprehensive health education is a promising tool for doing so. So for those who don't know KSAP, which stands for the Kentucky Association of Sexual Assault Programs, we are a coalition with our membership being Kentucky's Rape Crisis Centers, also known as Sexual Assault Support Programs, where individuals who are sexually assaulted or abused can reach out for free support services. And we have a 24-7 support line that's 1-800-656-HOPE for anyone seeking those support services. So for in our field for decades, the general response to addressing sexual assault and abuse has been focused on a response model, meaning that we step in and help people after they're harmed. But we know that response is not enough. By that time, trauma has already occurred. So studies also tell us time and time again that trauma, especially in childhood, 
may negatively impact an individual for life from worse health outcomes, both physically and mentally, to the inability to successfully engage in employment or school. So we've learned that we must center strategies that can stop sexual assault and abuse before it ever happens. And then I have picture number one, if that could be sh uh, shared. When 12% of females and 5% of males in Kentucky high schools have reported that they were sexually assaulted, and 21.6% of high schoolers attempted suicide after being sexually assaulted, we must act to protect our youth. So KSAP encourages listeners to think broadly about who we want to be as Kentuckians in 10, 20, or 30 years from now. Will we be able to tell our youth and children that we tried every possible evidence-informed strategy to prevent them from ever being sexually assaulted or abused and to equip them with the skills to lead healthier lives or are we only willing to continue offering solutions that seek to help them after they are harmed? One person being sexually assaulted or abused is too many. And this is why we support comprehensive health education. Thank you. Thank you, Layla. And thank you to KSAP. You've given us a lot to think about already this morning as we begin this conversation. Uh, Dr. Diane Currington, let's move over to you for your introduction. Hi, I'm Dr. Diane Currington. Um, I am a former JCPS teacher. I taught K-12 um, comprehensive sex education. Uh, I'm also now a faculty member at Bellarmine University. And so I do research that focus around um, traumatic experiences as well as comprehensive sex ed. And so this is passionate to me because I've lived it for more than 12 plus years related to how important comprehensive sex ed is to our students and the questions they have and the knowledge that they need to gain to protect themselves after they leave um, K-12. And so there's so many things that need to be answered and um, just helping teens walk through them so they can protect themselves as well when they move on to the college rim or into their adult life. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move over now to Kendia Motley. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, it is great to be before you guys today. My name is Kendia Motley. I'm a senior in high school and I work with the peer education program in Louisville, Kentucky on their teen council. And I, we, we get educated about sex education, whether that is bodily autonomy, STIs, STDs, consent, healthy decision-making, self-love. And then we go back into the community and we educate our peers, adults, whoever it is to educate on this topic that is often shun away from, but it is a very important that we educate on this human experience for every person, especially in school, regardless of socioeconomic status, orientation, race, sexuality, gender, to just have the chance to learn about it. Thank you. Thank you, Kendia. And last but not least, Katerina Hoskins. Hello, my name is Katerina Hoskins. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm an elementary school educator and sexual health researcher. Um, my research focus involves comprehensive sex education, sexual trauma, pleasure, online dating, abusive relationships, and prevention. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a personal experience of mine that kind of led me to really become passionate about comprehensive sex education. Um, you know, I've been passionate about it for quite some time. And in my experiences teaching elementary age children, I've unfortunately encountered some scenarios that are were unimaginable. You know, we are here to teach children to help them learn how to build their future. Um, but I found myself encountering students whose future was blocked by severe sexual trauma. And with some of these specific situations, without the language to express themselves, um, this some of our students and one in particular had experienced trauma and we as her educators were unaware of it. And the results of coping with this at, at such a young age without any guidance or comprehension of the trauma led to disassociation, stunted social emotional development, trouble engaging with peers and academic disruption. Um, 
It was months before we were able to identify and confirm the trauma and from there begin to appropriately address and work with this child. And these are children, you know, under the age of 10. Um, and so around the same time, I had started working with uh, teaching healthy relationships at a sober house for former victims of sex trafficking in Kentucky. And in my work here, I realized that while working with these adult women, they face some of the same significant gaps in their education. Um, so from this young child to these adult women, these gaps had not been filled. Um, and it made me kind of realize that there's a lot of work to be done in addressing uh, these topics. So we wanna really provide the best for our students and give them the best possible future. And I think comprehensive sex ed is a great tool for that. Thank you so much, Katerina. And you, you've all touched in one way or another on the safety issue, protecting our kids, keeping our kids safe, and how having information, having uh, this kind of educational material uh, available to our students is protective for them. It helps keep them safer. It helps them to be able to communicate um, when they're in an unsafe situation that they may not even know is, isn't the norm, right? And so without having these tools, we really are leaving our kids in Kentucky extremely vulnerable. Um, and Kentucky oh, and educational attainment. Kentucky has for the third year in a row, the highest rate of child abuse. We're high in teen pregnancy. We're high in, uh, sexually transmitted infection in our student population. Our statistics are high in sexual assault. We also see tremendous health disparities in all of these issues by race. We see from other states that comprehensive health education laws and comprehensive sex education can mitigate all of these problems. And in fact, comprehensive sex education covering healthy relationships, safe practices, and including abstinence can be, as some of you have mentioned, a primary prevention tool. So for the panelists, I'm gonna ask um, you to elaborate on that. And um, again, Layla, I'm gonna start with you again. Uh, I promise not to do that every time. Uh, and, and you touched on this in your introduction, but I understand that KSAP supports comprehensive health education because of the connection specifically between comprehensive health ed and prevention of sexual assault. Can you elaborate on that even more for us? Yes, thank you. And I, and I will sort of pick up from where I left off. And before I dive into that, you mentioned this uh, language primary prevention and to clarify for folks, that means stopping the harm before it happens. There's lots of ways to do prevention work, but that's the one where we can, we can stop it from happening at all. And that's really where this is core for us. And so if you could share pick two, I'd like to share with the listeners a few more statistics to really center us on why this is so important. And so a few others of those stats include that 80% of teenage girls who were sexually assaulted suffered serious mental illness. People who were sexually assaulted and abused are at a greater risk for trauma related health problems, including depression, PTSD, suicidal ideation, sleep disorders, and eating disorders. 40% of Kentucky women who responded to a study who were entering college reported that they were raped or sexually assaulted during their teen years. And that showed it, there was a connection to this negative impact on their entering GPA scores and their grades during their freshman year. So these stats help tell us the reality about just how prevalent and harmful sexual assault and abuses and why we must take all prevention steps possible to reduce and ultimately eliminate this harm. I mean, can you just imagine how phenomenal it would be if we can reduce it and therefore ridding a person from these negative health outcomes that are connected? So if we can move on to pick three, please. And comprehensive health education positively impacts these issues, just as Representative Wilner mentioned, it mitigates them. And a few things to highlight are that interpersonal skills based training, which is a part of comprehensive health education, uh, has been shown effective in impacting risk factors for perpetrating sexual assault. The next one is that pre-college education, including skills to refuse unwanted sex, is connected to preventing sexual assault in college. 
And the last piece of research I'll highlight here is that comprehensive health education has been shown to lower homophobia, build child sex abuse prevention skills, and reduce dating and intimate partner violence. So again, due to just these few examples that I've pulled from research-informed and research-based reports, this connection between the ability of comprehensive health education to reducing sexual assault and abuse is clear. And again, this is why we would support such a policy. Thank you. Thank you for that, Layla. You know, I was uh, in a meeting this morning and I'm in these conversations a lot where I'm hearing we need more mental health professionals in schools, we need more. And as a licensed psychologist myself and as someone who has advocated a lot for school mental health, of course, I'm all for more mental health professionals in schools, but we've got to get upstream of that. We've got to mitigate the trauma, Layla, like you've just described, if we could mitigate the trauma that's causing the need for people to, to be with a mental health professional, that's really where our focus needs to be. And I think, you know, from a policymaker perspective, this is really what we ought to be focusing on, not just, you know, how do we put band-aids on the wounds uh, once the wounds have been inflicted. Um, and, and with that, I'm, I'm gonna turn to Katerina uh, for the next part of this. And, you know, from your experience in academia and as an educator, what do you see? And you gave a very compelling and heartbreaking case study at the beginning of this. What specifically do you see as some of the harms uh, that our students are experiencing and how specifically would this policy mitigate those harms? Um, that's a great question, and I'm going to try to streamline it. There's so much going on in my mind right now, but um, some of the specific harms that we're seeing is, uh, you know, students, young people are becoming more, have are over time becoming more exposed to a lot of different things. You know, they have um, exposure and access to a lot without really having um, accurate uh, information to back that up, you know, as we, as technology increases. And so I'm seeing a lot of um, social emotional behaviors that are kind of unprecedented in schools right now. Um, you know, a big part of comprehensive sexual health education involves healthy relationships and boundaries. And um, we're seeing scholars who are unable to communicate in healthy ways with their peers. Um, not feeling safe and you know a big part of education in order to learn you have to feel safe and and I think part of that safety comes with information and being aware of one's body being aware of who a safe adult would be um, in some of the research that we specifically conducted in Kentucky uh, with some of my partners we found that um, women that we interviewed who had experienced sexual trauma 25% of those women had experienced this before the age of 12. So we are seeing a lot of these things that um, Layla mentioned happening with young people and comprehensive sexual health education is preventative. It is proven to be preventative of these outcomes because children have a knowledge about their bodies. They're able to express what's happening in the home. You know, they're able to identify a safe adult and have a conversation about something that maybe doesn't seem right and even determine whether something is right or not. You know, we may as adults understand if there's a scenario that um, shouldn't be happening, but children aren't really as aware of those things. So um, unfortunately, sexual trauma, teen pregnancy, all of these are things that we are seeing um, in large part in our schools. And um, I just, I, I wish I, I'm so sorry. I feel like I have so much more to say, but I'm getting a little off on the tangent here. Um, but I really feel that with the, with having educators who were trained in these health practices to really give accurate information and to provide a safe space, we could really make a difference for these kids. Thank you so much, Katerina. I hope that answers your question. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm gonna shoot the same question over to you, Diane. Um, so you know, the question is, what are some of the existing problems? How would comprehensive sexual health education help? And, and in particular, if you could talk to us a little about how this type of education improves outcomes across the lifespan. Um, so 
what I think um, and sex education is a lot of students with a lot of questions and unanswered questions and what does healthy relationships look like? Um, how do I call a doctor? Uh, what does it look like if I have questions about something with my reproductive system and I don't understand what's going on with my body? Why are these hormones and emotions um, behaving this way? Um, even about just sexual orientation or um, I notice that I'm sad all the time, but my mom or dad may be sad all the time too, right? And what does that look like for me? So all of these questions come up and um, comprehensive sex education in general, and just being able to recognize um, some of the, the health issues related to your reproductive system, right? And so like, I didn't know about having fibroids until I was almost in college, right? And that is prevalent in a lot of black women. And so these type of issues are very important to talk about early on because these are preventative me measures, right? Endometriosis. So it's not just about talking about like uh, preventing pregnancies and abuses too, it's about healthy outcomes, recognizing that when something is wrong with your body that where do I go to ask these questions to? Who is my safe or trusted adult is, which I stressed a lot. And oftentimes if they had homes where they had safe parents, I would say, who do your parents trust or feel safe with you going to, to ask these questions to? Now in other situations, some students don't have safe homes and don't have safe parents. And so how do we lead and guide them through these types of conversations and who do they go to and talk to if they have questions about um, what Katarina was saying about, you know, healthy or positive relationships or um, what does that look like when you go see a healthcare provider, right? What is a healthy and positive relationship with your healthcare provider? What is a healthy and positive relationship or touch with a healthcare provider? Like there's so many things that go with comprehensive sex ed that need to be talked about. And one thing Katarina brought up was like making sure that you have someone who is trained in the curriculum to do it. And so I think that's very, very important. So health educators are trained to do it. And those who are not trained to do it need to be calling in professionals to come in to speak. So I always had healthcare providers come in to speak um, in areas I was not strong in. That was not something I tried to take on myself. And I also I mean, the CDC says for health education standards that accessing valid information. So me going, reaching out to the community and showing the, the students where to go to receive valid information or how to look it up online is part of comprehensive sex education. So these are things that I found that was very valuable that they can take with them throughout their lifetime and not feel embarrassed about it and know where to go to ask these questions and who to ask these questions to. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. You know, I, I um, taught in the psychology department at Bellarmine for 20 years. And for most of those years, I taught lifespan development. And I would hear in, in just the course of our classroom discussions, um, the types of sex education that these college students had received in their K-12 education. And it was pretty shocking. Um, how, first of all, how little most of them received, uh, how many of them received only shame-based messages. Many of them felt very discouraged from asking questions. And even as college students felt that they didn't really have the basic information that they needed to, to keep themselves safe. Um, and so, Kindia, I'm going to turn to you as both a student, a high school student, and also as a peer educator. What do you think, and we've talking a lot about safety in this first part of the discussion, what do you think students need to know in order to be able to keep themselves safe? Thank you for that question. Um, well, first, it, it doesn't help that this idea that sex education is about the act itself is a disservice to the topics it touches on around it, like bodily autonomy, healthy decision-making, self-love, consent, STI, STDs, sexual health, access, 
to STD testing, reproductive anatomy, birth control options, and just general bodily autonomy. I know personally, and seeing the impact it has, it has had on my peers once educated is bodily autonomy. Starting there, for example, in, in nothing extreme, even in elementary school, growing up and saying vagina and penis was just like, it was like uncomfortable to say when, for what? That's who you are. And I feel like for starters, it sparks a deeper self-love within themselves because of this awareness of, of, oh, this is how my body works and the way my body works is okay. And the feelings that I'm having is okay. Like that acknowledgement. And, and it shapes them when they have that self-love to make better decisions for themselves and healthier decisions for themselves. And, it, and it's sad because I don't see any of that happening for my peers and it definitely never happened for me. And I feel like it's very inconsistent and unfair, although I am blessed and I'm honored to be in the program I'm in to be educated on myself and to be able to educate others, but I, I shouldn't have to go out I shouldn't have to be in a civic program to be educated on the topic. Students should naturally get that off top, being human beings with this human experience. So I feel like to keep them safe and healthy is keeping them educated. Because, you know, although I love, it, it does, it is impactful hearing it from your peer. And I love what I do and I love doing it. And I love that more and more people that, I'm glad I got to meet other peers who are so passionate about it and to see the impact it has had on the community, on my age group. But giving them um, just naturally stop making it an elephant in the room when it's not. It, it's perfectly natural. I feel like it's safer and healthier for my peers and me to acknowledge what we're feeling and not make us feel strange about it. And to let us know this is what you're feeling it's perfectly fine simple as that morally so Kindia, I, I love what you said about you shouldn't have to be you or nobody should have to be in a, a special civic program uh, to get this information right it's so fundamental to who we are as human beings uh, from the very beginning of life and and yet we treat these topics as off limits somehow. And that in itself sends a really important message, right. message, right? And, and so we know that, that currently the state of um, sexual health education in public K-12 schools is extremely variable. Uh, first of all, there's very little of it. Uh, there's really only one semester of health education at all that's required from K through 12. There's only one semester required and only a tiny portion of that might have anything to do with, with sexual health. So it's, it's small, but we also know that, that there's tremendous variability both from school district to school district, from school to school, and even from classroom to classroom. So a ninth grader in the same school might be getting completely different information than, than their peers in the classroom next door. And, and I, judging from some of the feedback and some of the questions and some of the emails that I get about this legislation, I think there are a lot of questions about what is age appropriate. What is age appropriate, medically accurate sex education? And Katerina, I'm going to turn over to you again. I know you really have focused on the early grades. And could you give us a sample of what appropriate, again, medically accurate, age appropriate would look like for K through five? Absolutely. Um, yes, I'll talk you through some of the um, categories that we would look at for a K through 12, K through five curriculum, and then get a little bit more specific from there. So the categories and core concepts that are involved in a K through five curriculum are anatomy and physiology, puberty and adolescent sexual development, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation and identity, sexual health, consent and healthy relationships, and interpersonal violence. And, you know, as, um, as was mentioned earlier by um, Dr. Currington, it is really important to have trained 
professionals. And I think that this bill would give us the opportunity to have some trained professionals coming in, trained educators, or to add training for our current educators that would allow this information to be accurate. And, you know, as an elementary school teacher, I have training on how to approach these topics in an age-appropriate manner. But the standards are laid out for us. So some of the examples of some of the standards that we would hope to teach to students by the age of, by the end of second grade would be to um, demonstrate ways to treat people of all genders, gender expressions, and gender identities with dignity and respect, um, to discuss, uh, to define reproduction and explain that all living things may have the capacity to reproduce, um, to demonstrate how to communicate personal boundaries and show respect for someone else's personal boundaries, um, to identify healthy ways for friends to express feelings, both physically and verbally, um, to define bodily autonomy and personal boundaries, a lot of what Kinsey was saying earlier, and then to explain why it is important to show respect for different kinds of families, such as nuclear, single parent, blended families, adoptive and foster families, um, and to be able to identify and, and respect these different group families and friend groups. Um, and then to identify situations that may be uncomfortable or dangerous. And this can extend from child sexual abuse to teasing and bullying as well. Um, and so again, these are all tools that I think many could agree are really relevant to younger age groups and really important in their social emotional development. And they are topics that as teachers, you know, we definitely touch on as much as we can, but there's a lot, there's not a lot of specific training for educators and it's not an area of focus. It's just something that may be addressed throughout the chaos of a general day in the classroom. But with these standards uh, set out for every school, for every teacher, and to have training that would allow teachers to be better informed, I think we would see a shift in the comfort because while these are important topics and a lot of people recognize that now who are in education, they don't have the comfort and I'm seeing that there's a lot of discomfort with how to express this and how to how to show it to our students because we just haven't had the training for it. Um, and I think we can all agree that, you know, understanding our own systems and understanding healthy boundaries and making a plan, for example, one of our other standards to maintain personal hygiene during puberty and to understand how that's different for different people of different backgrounds. Um, I think that that's all really important and relevant information for our students. And those are just some of the things you would touch on. <laughs> so it's a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot. And it's really every human interaction, right? It's so much more than just as, as Kindia said earlier, it's not just about the act of sex, right? It's so right. much larger and more comprehensive than that. Um, and uh, Diane, if you could just sort of expand on what Canarino was saying, you know, this whole issue of age appropriateness, I, I have the sense, you know, judging from some of the emails that I get, that there's a lot of confusion about age appropriateness. Um, and so could you maybe talk to us a little bit about how um, this kind of education might look different for a second grader than say a middle school student or a high school student? So yeah, so the topics would be around in the same realm. It just looks a little bit more advanced. Like we are teaching them how to access valid information. We are also starting to think about, for me as an educator, I started to think about culture, ethnicity, environment, background. When I talked about sex ed, I also include abstinence education, right? Because I mean, even if we say we're waiting until marriage, what does that look like for a married couple, right? To understand what healthy sex boundaries are or healthy relationship or healthy communication. What does that look like for someone who is thinking about being married or someone who's thinking about having a partner? Or, I mean, so it looks a little different and it's in more detailed. Um, definitely a lot of decision making and what that looks like and talking through students like how do they make decisions and why did they think the decision was right or wrong right so a lot of processing and discussions happen um really focusing on cultures right now it's very important to focus on culture environments right and we just talked about adverse childhood experience and how much trauma a uh, childhood trauma affects a student 
into their adulthood. And so if they don't recognize their traumatic experiences, right? And we're not trying to have them recognize it to a point where we're not providing them guidance and providing service to make sure they get healing. But this also follows them on into their adult life. I mean, I had a student who had a um, traumatic sexual experience by a family member at the age of nine, and it came back to haunt her her senior year. You know what I'm saying? And she started dealing with that and, and self-harm comes up and depression comes up and you can't focus on your schoolwork. You can't focus on any of these things because this was never resolved when the student was nine. And um, in understanding cultural backgrounds, a lot of families, you know, struggle with mental illness and struggle with talking about comprehensive sex ed or sex sex ed in general, or even abstinence with their students. So like, where are these students get the information from if their parents do not feel comfortable enough or culturally don't believe in it? Um, so these are some things to really process and think about. And, and so when I taught comprehensive sex ed, I was always mindful of my students and my audience and who their parents was and who their families was and how to approach the situation. And so I knew like if it was for religious religion, religious uh, reasons, they couldn't participate it in high school comprehensive sex ed, which is not an opt out policy, but I allowed them to opt out and we did some other things in process in another way. But um, you do have parents who opt out just because they wanna opt out and they have no, no reason. They just don't want their students to be a part of it anyway. Um, and so that was kind of frustrating, but I always shared all of my material with my parents. I always sat down with my parents and had conversations with them if they wanted to have conversations or wanted to, you know, start getting the ball rolling themselves first before we entered the classroom. Um, I think for middle school, it's kind of like a little tricky because when you say about K-5, I think fifth grade, fourth and fifth grade gets right there, like really close to middle school. And so what does that look like for them? And so it's still puberty and hygiene and how to recognize what's going on with their body, but the access to technology and the things that they are experiencing on their own by themselves, by being able to research on the internet, it becomes so much more than just that. Um, because I have questions and I'm like, what, what, where did you even get those type of questions from? And like trying to make sure you don't shame them for any of those questions either, right? And in, in saying, wow, that was very brave for you to ask these questions, let's talk through it. So those are just some of the things. Um, and I try to always relate it back to research or data or some type of literature that they can also research on their own and look at on their own too. That was very important because reliable research and access is very important because they will find things that you cannot believe that is not reliable. And then you have to break down those type of things too. And also being okay with the language that they use when you're in conference sex ed, right? Because culture is very important. And some of these, uh, terms that they use or their terms that they use in their communities, in their neighborhoods. And so like, okay, we can list all these terms, but let me tell you what the medically correct terms are and why it is important to use these terms to protect yourself and keep yourself safe. So those are some of the things I would say. You, you've said so many things that I feel like I want to respond to, and I'm sure the other panelists do too. I, you know, I'm, I'm struck by your conversation about trauma and the effects of trauma live on long past the trauma itself, right? The body remembers, the, the mind remembers at, at some level. And so we may see the effects of trauma many, many, many years later. And you're right, if it's not addressed, if it's not dealt with, that trauma is not going away on its own. Uh, you, you also brought up abstinence uh, and it is so important. And we know that abstinence is actually, you know, the safest choice uh, that young adolescents can make uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but if you're telling a child to wait until marriage and this child has been sexually assaulted or this child maybe has been experiencing sexual abuse from an early age 
what does that mean to that child to say, wait for marriage? Um, and the other thing that we know that da the data, the research tells us is that young folks who have experienced comprehensive sexual education are much more likely to choose abstinence than folks who have only had the abstinence message. Um, and I always say abstinence only works as long as you abstain. Uh, but once you're not abstaining or you don't have the choice not to abstain, you don't have the information, you don't have the tools that you need um, to make the decisions and to move forward from there. So you, thank you. I feel like I'm, I'm reiterating some of the important things that you've said, but it's, it's so important. Kindia, I'm gonna turn back to you here. You've heard about some of the things that ought to be included in good sexual health education, comprehensive, medically accurate, age appropriate. And I'm just wondering, you know, for the audience, uh, folks who are tuned in, if you're able to share any examples from your own school or maybe some of your, um, your peers of the types of education that they're getting without, you know, if they're not involved in the peer education program, what would, what would you know, typical look like for a current student? I'm embarrassed to say I have never seen it. Um, I, I've never seen it. I have no idea what it looks like um, as far as schools go. We, I have no examples to give you, unfortunately, because I, I guess the minimum, I, well, the maximum I can give you is this one sex ed 40 minute overview we got one time. Um, and it was basically a quick, don't do this, do this. Okay, take it or leave it. But um, that is very damaging. That was, and that was like in my sophomore year of high school. And that's very late to me, sophomore year of high, that was very late. And that was very, you know, we could have, we could have moved on without that. But the reality is with, and, and to talk, touch back on what Dr. Diane said about a lot of cultures slash parents don't feel comfortable enough to discuss these, these, these topics. And I personally blame it on this constant programming and generations of generations of teenagers of not being taught this in school and obviously the the curriculum is inspired by one perspective and by the people but you know I'm trying to think I'm trying to see I was trying to think of an example, but I actually, I, I really do not have any, and that's frustrating, but this, like, this constant programming of, like, oh, no, we don't, we don't talk about that. We, we, we leave that to the side. Why do I need to teach you about protection if you don't need to be doing it anyway? That idea, and kind of putting a cover on it, or from the simple idea of consent, for example, just teaching that maybe you don't want to hug when you greet, something as small as you don't want to you don't want a hand on your thigh during a prayer. You know what I'm saying? So there's so many things that I wish that I would see as moral, as, as moral things. And anytime, you know, from personal experience, my mom sometimes get frustrated. I grew up in a very religious household. And sometimes when we put religion in it, sometimes I'm like religion aside. And sometimes people take that as I'm saying, I don't believe in God. No, I'm talking morally speaking. This should be how it is. This should not have to be oh, this over explanation of anything. Morally, teaching consent, teaching, teaching these things and the fact that the curriculum is so far spread out, even the history, the reproductive oppression history, for me to know that I have a history behind my, my marginalized community of being a black woman of medical racism, to be aware that when I go in the hospitals, I need to be cared for, I need to be aware, I need to advocate for myself. But you don't even know the history of your own self. But so this really spreads, but I, unfortunately I have no examples of, that's what I, that was my wish, that is my dream of what I wish was in schools, but um, I've never experienced it. I think the fact that you can't think of an example speaks volumes, right? Of how much is lacking and how much, is needed. 
Um, I appreciate your bringing up the cultural issues and the importance of knowing that history. And we can see the effects of that in outcome data, right? That black women uh, so much at higher risk for all kinds of sexual health outcomes, higher risk for teen pregnancy, higher risk for maternal mortality uh, when they are pregnant. The list goes on and on and on and on, and it's deeply connected to that history. And more broadly, you talked about the multi-generational aspect of this. If we, you know, as an older adult, if I never got this information, then how can I speak to my children about it? If they never got it, how can they speak to their children about it? And, we, and, and we'll hear this sometimes from policymakers, let's just leave this to the parents. The parents, we should not assume that parents are equipped to have these conver conversations. Uh, we shouldn't assume that they have these conversations themselves. Um, and Kendi also spoke about, you spoke about um, consent and consent education is so important. It's so central to comprehensive sexuality education. Layla, I wanna turn this back to you. Um, what does teaching consent mean to KSAP from a sexual assault prevention perspective? Yeah, and, and you know, Kenby started down this road already and it, it is more, um, it covers more topics and it really means to us that it begins in early childhood from talking about that hug example that Kendia gave to using someone's coloring book or sharing food or when to start or stop tickling or even posting pictures or videos on social media, which is a very common thing that even young people are doing. And, and the best way that I've heard it described is that teaching consent is a life skill. And it overlaps with some of the other themes that everyone else on the panel has uh, mentioned today, such as the bodily autonomy, boundaries, and decision making. And then I have a consent graph, if you could, uh, or graphic, if you could please share that. This is something that was created by a third grade teacher, and some of you may have seen this before, because I remember hearing about it in the news. And they were saying, wow, look at this teacher is teaching consent. Of course, you, there were things said um, both positive and negative, but I found it to be something that shows how can, they can, she broke consent down really clearly here to mean giving permission, right? So this was to help kids understand those boundaries and how to handle a situation if they want something and someone else doesn't. These situations are deep into, or excuse me, they continue into adulthood from interactions with family, friends, coworkers, and anyone else you might interact with in the public. And they will not only impact um, interpersonal relationships within intimate partner relationships, but also outside of those. And something I, I've, I love having these discussions with people I'm around. I just wanna talk about consent. What can it look like? How does it look like in your relationships? I like to ask my friends, uh, I love talking to kids in my life around just some of the things we mentioned early on, but what I'm told from some folks is that it feels awkward to communicate openly about their needs, especially if you're talking about that intimate partner relationship. But then I hear from others that it's a beautiful thing when they can be amongst their, the people they're close with and talk about their needs and respect each other's boundaries. So we believe these are skills that we can teach. And the more we talk about it and we make it the norm, the more people will grow into having healthier lives. And so teaching about consent is an integral piece to this, uh, to comprehensive health education. Still getting the hang of this Zoom thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Turn off mute. Um, I, I'm going to just pose a, a, a thought experiment here and really would like to hear from each of you. Uh, if this bill were to pass and we were to have age appropriate, medically accurate, fully inclusive, comprehensive sexual health education across Kentucky and all Kentucky public schools, what would that look like? What would that feel like? What impact would that have on our kids, on their families, on our communities? So I'll start if that's all right. Yes, please, Katerina, please. 
Um, well, I'd like to touch on a few things. You know, we do have the research and information that indicates um, what it does like, like for some communities that have begun to implement comprehensive sex education. When we look at cities and countries that have implemented it actually from a pre-K through 12 level, we see that when we compare, for example, um, the United States with, uh, with Dutch health, sexual health outcomes, we see that teen pregnancy, uh, American teen, teenagers give birth at five times the rate of their Dutch peers. Um, their Dutch peers have fewer abortions. Um, we see that in the United States, people under the age of 25 make up half of the new SCI cases each year, while in the Netherlands, um, they account for 10% of new cases in, that, in the country. And socially in cities, states, and countries where um, comprehensive sex ed has been implemented from a young age, uh, the rates, uh, there, there are reported higher rates of sexual satisfaction in adults. Um, so just better, higher rates of communication and all those good things that we really want to be a part of relationships at whatever stage that we start to, you know, develop different romantic relationships and even fr friendships and other healthy relationships. Um, Adolescents who received comprehensive sex education have were significantly less likely in a report last year to report teen pregnancy in the past few years um, than those who received no formal sex education. And so I really see this being a positive, having a positive effect on our community as a whole. We've we've talked about how our students really need this information, but that maybe parents don't have it either. And that's where some of the gaps in communication are happening or some misunderstandings about what would be taught. And I really see implementing this as a norm, as Layla was saying, and, and creating these new norms for our education could really transform the community as a whole and help involve adults um, in these conversations and kind of fill in those gaps from both directions and really improve relationships and communication. Um, we can see how well-spoken and aware Kindia is. I just love listening to her talk, honestly. Um, and I'm just so amazed by her. And it sounds as though she feels strongly that participating in this special comprehensive program has been a really positive experience. And I think if we can imagine some of the, some of the students and adults and people we've interacted with having that kind of an that information and that kind of an outcome, I think it would just be really positive overall. Um, our students have a right to access knowledge and information about themselves. And it's our job to provide accurate information and safe spaces and to empower them. And so I think we really could arm them with the tools to be successful and healthy. Thank you for that, Katerina. And I love this researcher perspective. We don't have to imagine it. We can see what it looks like. And furthermore, for anyone watching this, we can look at Kindia and listen to Kindia and we can see what it looks like. So that's that's fantastic. Who else would like to take that, that question? I think for me, it will look like it needs to be equitable, right? And it needs to be accessed on all levels uh, across all schools. I think it will help several communities start to, we need to start having this conversation around trust, right? And so Kendia talked about the history of black and brown people not trusting healthcare medical professionals or trusting anything anybody says about their health because it has traumatic context behind it. And so I think it's going to be very important first to start with building trust in relationships and then to start uh, working through some of the th things related to comprehensive sex ed and what the students may have, and even in the communities, uh, providing that opportunity to allow them to say what they need to say and build that trust and then start to educate. Um, so I think it's, it's more than just schools, right? I think it's outside of schools too, and it goes back to schools and partnerships and communities and environments and supporting them and meeting people where they are. Um, and so that's, where part of my research is behind. It's so important to build that trust and relationship and provide safety. Um, I think it's going to be the most important thing. And of course, um, I still stick behind, it needs to be qualified people. It cannot be coaches who don't really wanna do this work. You know, It needs to be people who understand what they're doing without throwing it on another teacher's plate. 
where it's going to provide them to be so stressed out about adding another thing to their curriculum when it doesn't have to be. There are trained people out there who are willing to do this work, just allow them to do it and um, allow them to be clear about what they need to be doing across the board. So it's equitable and it's great access for all students and parents in the community. Beautifully said. Can and you I'll add as well? Oh, is that okay? Yes, absolutely, Layla. Yes. Well, I just wanted to wrap it back to, around to the beginning of what I said is that this, if we were to implement this in our communities, I mean, we would see a reduction in sexual assault and abuse, which means a reduction in trauma. And that would lead to thriving, healthier individuals and healthier relationships. Uh, the ability for people to not have to deal with the effects of trauma means they can reach their potential in life with education or career attainment. You know, we talk a lot in Kentucky about our workforce. We have a healthier workforce for whoever that resonates with. You know, I mean, that that's also a part of healthy individuals are healthy throughout their lives and all their aspects. So those are just a few things I wanted to add. Thank you, excellent. Kindia, what would, what would it look like if we yes. had this in place? Yes, first I wanna say thank you so much, Ms. Katarina, that put a, I made my day, thank you. Um, well, I feel like it would empower inclusivity and healing. Because the reality is this is a generational type of generation thing. And as we move on year by year, we want to progress and we want to get better. And although, and I feel like with this type of education, it's so difficult separating that kid to adult instead of looking at kids as adults in the making. Because when you keep that, that I feel like this wall between it it, it kind of it keeps this line between being a kid and then an adult. Like, okay, as a kid, I can't teach you this, you're a child. Once you hit that 18, you're just supposed to automatically know how to handle all these decisions, all these things. But I feel like, uh, for example, a 50 year old man right now, although he's an adult, that he still has a gap in his life from that childhood confusion that he couldn't put words to all those years. And now he can't implement or pour into anybody and educate them on their confusions because he doesn't know for himself. So I feel like this can truly empower inclusivity and healing and educate one another. And it's safer for everybody involved when you understand who you are and how everybody else is. So that's what I feel like. So eloquent, thank you. Healing, empowering, all of all of those things. Uh, and let me just um, turn it to the audience for a moment for anyone who's watching this. Uh, I hope that you are feeling as moved by this conversation as I am, and that you may be thinking to yourself, what can I do? How can I help? How can we move this issue forward in Kentucky? And I think the fact that you're listening into this conversation is an important first step. I would encourage you to read more. Uh, I believe that the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky is gonna be sharing some resources with the archived version of this. So that'll get you started. Um, I would encourage you if you're working for with an organization uh, to have conversations with that organization. How can we organizationally get on board, support this legislation, contact our legislators, let them know that this is an important step in moving our state forward and making Kentucky a healthier, safer place for our kids. And as Kindia said, and for our adults, for our communities. Um, I, I'm just gonna turn it back to the panelists uh, to see if any of you have any specific thoughts about how people who are listening in on this may be able to help move this issue forward. Sure, I'll jump in. I mean, you really hit on the main ones. It's continuing to educate yourselves about this issue. Uh, and anything else that, that reduces harm, not just sexual assault and abuse. I know that's what we focus on here at the coalition, but harm of cross, you know, any kind of harm. And then be an advocate on the local and state levels. So yes, contact your legislators, contact your uh, local city councils, contact your school boards, and just try to help spread the message of how impactful comprehensive health education is. 
Thank you, Layla. Katerina? <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of um, open conversation and communication. I think if you learn something new from this webinar or if you're um, feeling inspired to go ahead and share it and to have conversations with people in your community to let them know this is something that's really affecting us. It's really important. I know Layla mentioned um, contacting representatives and um, you know advocating for what you believe in. And I think really emphasizing the thought of, for me as an educator at the school board, I think there's a lot of times an idea that maybe parents, families, communities would not want these types of changes. And the truth is that the data shows us quite the opposite. So make your school board aware of that. Send emails, make phone calls, offer to volunteer and participate and do the do the work, do the legwork to make these changes really happen. Um, I think they're important and we really want to move them forward quickly. So we need community support for that. Thank you. We are right up to the hour here. It's exactly three o'clock. And I want to be respectful of our panelists' time, of the foundation's time. Um, but I don't know if we have any uh, questions and if there, if panelists have a few minutes to stick around for any questions that may have come in. Ashley, that's, I guess, a question for you. Um, I am seeing one question that was answered in the Q&A. Um, I don't see any open ones. Uh, we'll do, how about we do a last call? And in the meantime, um, I will just remind people um, that we are going to be sending an email with some resources on it. Um, so keep a lookout in your inbox for that. Um, and then feel free to reach out to us, um, check out our website, healthy-ky.org, follow us on social media, um, or email us. My email is right there on the screen for you. Um, and then also just a reminder that we do have several Health for a Change um, webinars scheduled for after the new year, and uh, we will be sending out much more information on those. Um, so keep a lookout for that. Um, still not seeing any additional Q&A. So um, I will thank you all very much, um, Representative Wilner and our esteemed panel. What a great conversation today um, and uh, really great perspectives uh, from all of you. So we really appreciate it. Um, we hope you all have a, a very um, 